We must begin when we try to do these things to recognize, we got to begin by recognizing the fact that God is not meant to be understood. He has chosen to reveal certain things about himself that we can learn and know, at least in some degree, but not everything. Do you know this goes against man's nature? It is in the nature of man to examine, to test, to discover. He wants to get it into the lab and take it apart and put it back together. That's what science is. In the laboratory, the scientist is the master. And if it need be, he will tear the secrets out of what he is trying to discover. This is why science has so much trouble with God. Because God will not submit to be examined, calculated, and totally discovered. When you're dealing with God, he is the master. And science is at a loss on how to proceed in that environment. Many struggle with the fact that some of the things about God cannot be explained. Our minds just can't conceive it. We can't get our brain to quite wrap around it. Some of what God reveals about himself, our brain says, isn't that impossible? Don't let that throw you. Actually take comfort in it. God is in so many ways beyond our ability to comprehend. Would you want it any other way than that? Would you want a God that you could completely understand? If you could completely understand him, he would be a very small God. And he would have just as many reasons to bring his problems to you as you have to bring them to him. In Job chapter number 38, after over 30 chapters of unprofitable arguments between friends, God st steps in and asks over 30 questions in that one chapter about how creation was performed. He says, who did that? And where were you when this happened? And how did this take place? Basically he's saying, if you can't even answer the basic questions of the place where you live, how do you possibly think that you can know me and understand me? Now our reason here, our purpose here is not to try to totally understand everything there is to know about God but to learn what he has chosen to reveal about himself and believe it. One of the hardest truths to truly comprehend is the Trinity. Now, the word Trinity is not found in the Bible. It is a truth that is taught or assumed from cover to cover. In heaven, the angels cry, holy, holy, holy in worship of our triune God, the Trinity. When we use the word Trinity, we mean one God in three persons. One God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Our forefathers, in trying to define and explain in understandable terms the truth of the scripture, they wrote this. In this trinity, nothing is before or after, nothing is greater or less, but all three persons co-eternal, together, and equal. They also wrote this, I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of him before all ages, God of God, light of lights, very God of very gods. Begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made. And they wrote this, I believe in the, in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, which proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and Son together is worshipped and glorified. We do not have three gods, we have one God in three persons. And your brain says, I don't understand. And I say, me neither. 
but your brain begs for something to get a handle on what are we dealing with? One God in three persons. Of course, this is impossible to understand, but let me give you two illustrations that will at least allow you to get a toehold. These are old illustrations. They did not originate with me, but I use them when trying to describe the Trinity to someone who doesn't understand or is trying to get a grasp. The first old illustration concerning the, the Trinity is an egg. If you have an egg, you have one egg. But if you crack that egg, what do you have? You have three parts. You have the shell, and it's got its own attributes. You've got the white, and it's got its own attributes. And you have the yellow, and it has its own attributes. If you saw any one of those pieces, you'd say, that's an egg, that's an egg, that's an egg. Each of it is all egg. But you don't have a total egg until you have all three pieces. That's not a good illustration, but at least it gets us going. If you mix it with the next illustration in your mind, you get as probably as close as you're going to get. The second old illustration is the, the state or the, uh, the properties of water. You have water as a solid, you have water as a liquid, you have water as a gas, you have water as ice, you have it as liquid water, and you have it as steam. Each of those are entirely different in their properties, but yet it is all water. Each has a different function, but it is all water. Not a good illustration, but between the two of those, you begin to understand maybe a little foothold on what the Trinity, how to define it. In the Trinity, each one has a different office, but they are all involved. They are not separate in their work. To think of them in their different offices can be very helpful and makes us think more accurately. For instance, have you ever heard or maybe said yourself, God died on the cross? Very often young people, kids especially, will say that God died on the cross. That is an accurate statement. But it is more accurate to think of it in terms of the Trinity. God the Father and God the Holy Spirit did not die on the cross. God the Son, Jesus Christ, died on the cross. And when you think of them in terms of their offices, it is very helpful. Another quote, it is important that we think of God as Trinity in unity, not confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. You say, what in the world did that mean? Let me read it again. It is important that we think of God as Trinity in unity, neither confounding the person nor dividing the substance. We need to think of God as one God in three persons, completely in unity. And we don't mix up the persons, but we don't separate them into three gods. That's what it means. God is in complete unity, he has different offices, and we don't mix the offices, but we don't bid, split it into three gods. Let me read it again. It is important that we think of God as trinity and unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. And one last thought before we really get rolling here tonight. When we think of three persons, we think of conversations, discussions that are necessary to maintain unity and agreement. We have to keep on all on the same page when you have three persons. You have to keep on the same page by communicating. This is not true of God. The Trinity is always completely and automatically unified in every single thing that they do. It's a poor illustration, but it helps my mind think in the way that it should in this realm. When I worked construction for, the, for Craig, I worked on some very good crews. And when we would pull up to a job site... The guys would get out of their trucks, and nobody said a word. Everybody just went to work. Everybody knew the job they were supposed to do. There was no, you do this, you do this, you do this. There was no discussion about it. The job just started and went, and everybody knew exactly what they were supposed to do without communicating. That's not a good illustration, and you could break that illustration down. If you know construction at all, you could break that illustration down in a heartbeat. But it does help you to understand 
that God doesn't have to have God the Father doesn't have to have discussions with God the Son and the Holy Spirit to keep them all on the same page. They are all totally unified and the work goes forward because they all are always in complete unity. It is unity in Trinity and Trinity in unity. One God in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As we sing, as we read, as the special music is, is done, look for the Trinity. Look to understand it in a greater way. Remember, the word Trinity is not found in the, script, in the Bible. That word cannot be found. But if you're trying to find the Trinity where it's taught and prove it by Scripture, there are three main places that you can look that are very easy to remember if you're trying to discover the Trinity. The first place is in creation. Think about Genesis 1-1. In fact, I'll let you quote that with me. Genesis 1-1 and 2. Quote it with me. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the waters. Good. So here we have at the very beginning of creation, in the beginning, God, and then we have the Spirit moving on the face of the water. If we drop down in that same passage to verse number 26, God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Now we're using a plural word in our image, in our likeness, let us. Okay, so now we have a plural word, but in the very next verse, in, chapter, in verse number 27, so God created man in his own image, and in the image of God created he him. And so we have a plural and we have a singular, and you say, no, what is going on here? And we have the Trinity is what we have, one God in three persons. In Colossians 1 and John 1, Christ is identified as the creator. So we have God the Father in creation. We have God the Spirit in creation. We have God the Son in creation. Now in itself, this may not be totally clear, but it gives us at least a starting point. So if you're looking for the Trinity to prove it or to discover it, Genesis chapter number 1 in creation. The absolute clearest place to uh, see the Trinity is at Christ's baptism. That is why I had... Um, John read all three parallel passages on Christ's baptism because there, I hope you were reading and paying attention as that went through, you could see all three persons of the Godhead at the baptism of the Lord. Of course, the Lord was in the water, the, the, the voice from God the Father from the heaven saying, this is my beloved son, and you see the spirit descending like a dove. And this is the easiest place to see the Trinity. The third easy place to find the Trinity is at the beginning and the ending of most of Paul's books in the New Testament. For example, Galatians 1.3, Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 13.14, which is the end of, the, of 2 Corinthians, The grace of the Lord Jesus the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. So in most of Paul's writings at the beginning and the end of his books, he lists at least one, two, or, th two or three members of the Trinity um, in each one of his beginnings and endings of his books. These are both easily found and seen. When you're looking for the Trinity, the easiest places to find it is one creation, two, the Lord's baptism, and three, the beginnings and endings of Paul's writings. The difference between what we're doing and sitting in a college class trying to discover these things educationally is what we do with it in the end result. How should the knowledge of the Trinity affect us? The fact that we have one God and three persons, a triune God, what difference should that make in your existence? Well, knowledge of the Trinity should have two main effects in your life. 
first effect it should have in your life is wonder. Wonder. It is a tragedy that we have lost the wonder that we had when we were kids. As a kid, you did not have to have everything explained in order to appreciate it. You didn't have to understand how it all worked. You could just be lost. And do you remember as a kid being lost in wonder at the things that you were seeing? When you went to an amusement park, you didn't have to know how the ride worked. You didn't have to know how much co it cost or the sugar content of the cotton candy. When you were there, you were just lost in the wonder of the place. And as adults, we lose that. We often lose our wonder even of God. It's almost like, and I do not mean to be irreverent here at all. In fact, it's the exact opposite of what I'm trying to say here. But it's almost like we're afraid if we wonder that it's going to end up something like the great and powerful Oz on the Wizard of Oz. Do you remember how disappointing that was when you were a kid? And they pulled back, uh, Dorothy wanders back there and she moves the curtain and here's this guy on a microphone and you're like, oh brother, what is this? And it's almost like that's the feeling that we have if we wonder too much about our God that we're going to somehow pull back a curtain we weren't supposed to see and we're going to be disappointed at what we find out. My friend, that'll never happen. You can never find a spot of God that is disappointing or less than what you expect. There is no danger here. Let yourself be overwhelmed by God, a God who cannot be understood. Don't shrink back from what you don't understand. Embrace it. God is greater than you can conceive. And the Trinity proves this. Your brain wants to shut down as it tries to understand it. Embrace that. God is amazing. Allow yourself to wonder. The second effect it should have on you is worship. Let your wonder turn to worship. Take what you discover about God back to Him in the form of worship. Worship Him for His being. Worship Him for His unity. Worship Him as the one true God. Discover the work of the three persons of the Godhead and worship the Father for His work. Worship the Son for His work. Worship the Holy Spirit for His work. To give you a hint, generally speaking, the Father gives the gift, the Son is the gift, and the Spirit teaches or empowers the gift. Figure out this, discover these things, and worship God. Worship is lost in our day, but it's not, it was not, it's not always been a lost art. A.W. Tozer quotes a man named Faber. There's two of his quotes, his worship in here. It's, there's a mistake in the book. They've, it got split. There was a miscommunication. Look in the front page here. These are products of a man who has wondered about his God and turned it into worship. At the bottom in the box, timeless, spaceless, single, lonely, yet sublimely three. Thou art grandly, always only, God in unity. Lone in grandeur, lone in glory, who shall tell thy wondrous story? Awful, meaning full of awe, awful trinity. This is when you have concentrated on your God and let your wonder grow. This is the outcome. Your heart begins to worship. The second one, if you turn to the very back page, there's a little box underneath at the back. This is the beginning here. O blessed Trinity, O simplest majesty, O three in one, then back where we were just out, at thou art forever God alone, holy Trinity, blessed equal in three, one God, we praise thee. Let your mind wonder about God. Let it be filled with awe. And as you discover who your God is, worship Him. Get lost in your God. Start with the Trinity. One God in three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.